Have you ever wondered how to make sense out of the book of Revelation? Have you ever thought, I'm going to put the book of Revelation aside because it's just not understandable. It's a book of mystic symbols, a book of confusing beasts, a book that's more frightening than encouraging. During my over 50 years of ministry, many people have approached the book of Revelation that way. But I'm going to make the book of Revelation simple for you today. There are three major principles to understand Revelation. If you understand those principles, you are going to understand this book. It's going to be one of the most exciting books in the Bible. Principle number one, the word revelation means an unfolding. It means a revealing. Something that is revealed is not closed. So approach the book of Revelation with the sense that God has revealed his truth in this book for end times. And I give God credit for making plain that which is most important. So revelation, here's your first principle. It is understandable. It is a revelation. Principle number two, revelation is written in a prophetic code. It is written with symbols. And for every symbol that God gives, he has given an explanation or an interpretation for that symbol. Did you get that point? If God gives a symbol in Revelation, he gives an explanation for that symbol. Let me give you some examples. Revelation chapter 13, God says this, I saw another beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his crowns the name of blasphemy. Now notice, I saw another beast rising up out of the sea. That seems strange, a strange beast with seven heads and ten horns rising up out of the sea. But if you understand the prophetic key, if you understand the meaning of that book of Revelation and the meaning of those symbols, it just makes perfect sense. So what is a beast in Bible prophecy? According to Daniel, and the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are companion books, And the symbols in Daniel and Revelation are consistent. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, it says, The beast which you saw is a king. In chapter 7, verse 23, it says it's a kingdom. So in Bible prophecy, a beast represents a king or a kingdom. So when the Bible says, I saw another beast rise up out of the sea, The Bible interprets that beast as a king or a kingdom. So a kingdom is rising up out of the sea. Then the Bible says, what is the sea? Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 says, the waters of the sea that you saw are multitudes, nations, peoples, and tongues. So the book of Revelation identifies the sea as peoples. So when a beast rises up out of the sea, it is a kingdom rising up out of a populated area of the earth. What about this idea of horns? What does that represent? In the Bible, horns represent power. So here is a powerful nation or a powerful political or religious power that rises up in a peopled area. We find these symbols throughout the book of Revelation. One of the things that I have done in my studies is to identify 25 major symbols in the book of Revelation and given their biblical meaning. For example, you have in the book of Revelation uh, the idea of the dragon. What does that represent? Well, according to the Bible, the dragon represents, according to Revelation 12, verse 7 and verse 9, it represents the devil. You have a lamb in the book of Revelation. What does that represent? Of course, you would know a lamb represents Jesus. Now, if you would like a copy of these 25 symbols and their meaning in the book of Revelation, all you need to do is put a comment in the below. Just write a comment below. And if we have enough comments that come in, um, in a couple of days we'll put a link in and you can download 25 symbols and their meaning for the book of Revelation. I'd love to give that to you, so be sure to comment. And incidentally, too, if you really like this video, 
push it out to your friends, share it with them, and subscribe to our videos because we have so many more. So, three principles on understanding the book of Revelation. How to make sense. Number one, understand that it is written in symbols, and if you understand those symbols, you can apply them and you unlock the key to the mystery of the book of Revelation. You're going to love my guide to understanding those symbols, so be sure to comment below. Now, here's the second principle. Understand the great controversy theme in the book of Revelation. Every major line of prophecy in the book of Revelation portrays a controversy between Christ and Satan, between Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and Satan, the dragon, and of course, the beast. And so understand when you're reading Revelation that there is this great controversy between good and evil, great controversy between Christ and Satan. Read it with those eyes and it, it'll come to life to you. Thirdly, recognize that in every chapter of Revelation, Jesus is front and center. Look at the book of Revelation through the eyes of Christ. Now, I'm going to go over Revelation every single chapter and show you Jesus at the center and show you Jesus at the center of prophecy, and you will be able to make sense out of Revelation. It'll leap off the pages and your heart will thrill. So stay with me. The Bible says this is the revelation of Jesus. Where did Jesus get it? Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John. So, the book of Revelation is born in the heart of God. And God gives it to Jesus, and Jesus gives it to the angel. And the angel wings his way from worlds afar and gives it to John. And John writes it down. So we read the book of Revelation with a sense of awe. We read it with a sense of wonder because we know it comes from the heart of God. This is no human book. This is no ordinary book. This is no book that's simply written reflecting the culture of the day. This is God's last day message for humanity coming from the heart of God. Now, there are three blessings in reading Revelation. Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads. So when you read the book of Revelation, the Spirit of God's going to speak to you. And those that hear... That word for hear in the Greek language is akuo, and it means understand. So you need to do more than read it with your mind, but understand it with your heart. Those that understand Revelation, you're going to understand it. And it says those that keep the things that are written therein for the time is at hand. So you read it, you understand it, but you read and understand so that you do something. It changes your life. You keep the things that are therein. Now, the first chapter of the book of Revelation reveals the theme of the entire book. It reveals that Jesus Christ is center of every prophecy. That when you read the book of Revelation through the eyes of Jesus, and you see Jesus as the center of every chapter, it makes such a difference. Now, where is Jesus in chapter 1? Notice in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, 5 and 6, it says this, verse 6, the end, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God, and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Who is Jesus? The Christ of Revelation is that Jesus is going to wash your sins, that Jesus is going to forgive you, that Jesus is going to deliver you from guilt. Who is this Jesus? He's the one that washed us from our sins. He's the one that made us priests and kings to God. What does that mean? He makes us. What is a king? Jesus sanctifies you. Jesus changes you. You become a part of the royal family of heaven. What is a priest? A priest is an intercessor between God and man. So a priest is one who witnesses. When you come to Jesus, he washes you clean. He puts a new smile on your face, a new song in your heart. You're free from guilt. He empowers you to live a new life, and you go out as part of the royal family of heaven, as a new witness for Christ. And what do you witness of? Verse 7, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him. So every eye will see him. He's coming with clouds. You go out to witness that Jesus is coming soon. The great theme of the book of Revelation is the second coming of Christ. Now, Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. They were seven literal churches. 
and it was written to them according to the Bible. Here the Bible says, write down what I show you, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. That's Revelation 1 verse 4. So the writing to those seven churches applied to them, but it applied to Christians in every age, and it applies to our generation. It is written to them so that as we read it, we understand this prophecy as applying to end time. Where do you find that? You find that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, here the angel says to John, write the things that you have seen, past, and the things which are, present, and the things which take place after this. So when you read Revelation, some of Revelation's prophecy are in the past. Some of the application is in the present. But then much of that application is in the future. John pictures Jesus as walking among the candlesticks, walking among the churches. So Jesus is pictured among his people. So this Christ that washes us, this Christ that changes us, this Christ that is coming again is not far distant from us in our sorrows, in our trials, in our joys, in our sorrows, in our mountain peaks when we sing praises to God and we walk through the dark valleys. The Bible says Jesus is there. He is the Christ who is not far distant. He is the Christ that is near. That is the Christ of Revelation. Now, in chapters 2 and 3, we find the story of the seven churches. And the seven churches of Revelation represent seven literal congregations that lived in John's day. But they also represent seven epochs or periods of time of the church in every generation. In each of those churches, the Bible message ends with, He that overcomes, he that overcomes. What is the message that Jesus is giving to the seven churches? What is the message that Jesus is giving to your life and mine? And that is this. Whatever state we find ourselves in, we can overcome by the grace of God. The first church is the church of Ephesus. They battled apostasy and error and doctrinal impurity, doctrinal heresy. But yet, as they battled that, they toiled so much that they left their first love and they drifted away from Christ. The message to Ephesus is this, when you were once a Christian and you drifted away and you are spiritually barren, through Jesus you can overcome that spiritual lethargy. The Bible talks about the church at Ephesus and Smyrna, and we won't go over all of these. The Bible talks about the church at Pergamos. What's all about that church? It's a church of compromise. It's a church that compromised its integrity, compromised its moral principles. It's a church that let error flow in. What's God's message to that church? When you've compromised, you can overcome. If you have compromised your Christian values, through Christ you can overcome. The Bible ends with the church at Laodicea. What's everything about that church? Look, Laodicea is a church found in its complacency. Incidentally, there are seven churches. There's not eight or nine. God doesn't call some remnant movement out of Laodicea. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the amen. Who says it? Who says it? The amen. What does amen mean? When do you put amen? At the beginning? No, at the end. So there's nothing after the amen. The angel says amen. So the the, the, the latest thing in church is not going to be spit out of Christ's mouth. The amen says it's going to be revived. Why? Because Jesus is the faithful, true witness of the Father. And there'll be a new revelation of the Father, new revelation of his love and grace. And then it says here that um, he's the beginning of the creation of God. He's the beginner, the one who began all creation. So the almighty creator will recreate later Laodicean's heart. There'll be a mighty revival in Laodicea, and that church will rise fair as the sun and and as terrible as an army with banners, and it'll go out to proclaim God's last day message to the world. So Jesus, in Revelation 2 and 3 with the seven churches, is the one that lets his people overcome and enables them to be victorious in every age. 
What about Revelation 4 and 5? In Revelation 4, John looks up and he sees a throne in heaven. In spite of what happens on earth, God is ultimately in control. And the theme of Revelation chapter 4 is the Jesus that sits upon his throne. It is the Christ that will enable all of his people to be victorious and conquer. There's an interesting text that some people wonder about. It says that John looks up and he sees four living creatures. Those four living creatures are filled with eyes in front and in back. Let me make it simple for you. It talks about this creature full of eyes. What do eyes represent in the Bible? You see, the Bible explains its own symbols. Some people are very confused, but if you understand the Bible, you'll be able to understand these symbols very, very simply. In the book of Ephesians, the Bible tells us exactly what eyes represent. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So what does eyes represent? They represent understanding. They represent enlightenment. They represent wisdom. So here in Revelation chapter 4, when the Bible says that um, I saw four living creatures full of eyes. So what does four represent? Universality. Who are these living creatures? We'll talk about that. They're full of eyes. They're full of what? Enlightenment, understanding, wisdom. In other words, it's the, it's the wisdom of God. And it says before the throne, I saw these four living creatures. One was like a lion. Now, Jesus is the lion of the chi- tribe of Judah. So he is the royal one of heaven. Then it says like a calf or like a bull. That was sacrificed in the day of atonement. That is sacrifice. So Jesus, the lion, became an element of sacrifice when he became, the next symbol is a man. And then it says that was the third living creature, the fourth living creature like an eagle. So Jesus is ascended. He flies back to God's throne. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who becomes a human sacrifice. He is a man, lives that perfect life, and he goes back to heaven. Those creatures around the throne, full of wisdom and enlightenment, are praising Jesus because the lion of the tribe of Judah became a sacrifice and died, but then he ascended to heaven. In chapter 5, so chapter 4 is all about praise. It's all about praising Jesus as king. Jesus is sacrifice. Jesus is creator at the end. Revelation chapter 5. We come to Revelation 5, and the Bible there talks about John weeping, and John weeps because he looks up into heaven and he sees a book that, that, that is open. And that book, of course, is the book of judgment. And the sins of all humanity are there, and nobody can open it. But then one, a bloody lamb steps forth. A bloody lamb in heaven? Yes, it's a picture of Jesus. And he comes and he opens the book. He's the only one worthy. And all of heaven begins to sing. And what do they sing in chapter 5? They sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. So the theme of chapter 1 the Christ that died for us, the Christ that lives for us, the Christ that makes us priests, the Christ that is coming again, the Christ that walks among his people. The thieves of chapter 2 and 3, whatever state you find yourself in, through Jesus Christ, you can be an overcomer. The theme of chapter 4, Jesus is on the throne and creatures are around that throne worshiping him because he lived for us and died for us and he's and because he's our high priest. Chapter 5, a judgment scene. The book is opened, and as that book is opened in chapter 5, nobody can open that book except Jesus Christ, and all humanity is saved through Jesus. Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, we find the story of the seven seals. And as these seals are opened one after another, the first four seals, you see a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, a pale horse. This, these represent the Christian church as it goes forth to take God's message to the world. The white horse, the Christian church in the first century goes forth to conquer and it's conquering. The devil gets angry. He tries to destroy the church. Red horse, persecution during the days of the early centuries, 100 to 300 AD. The Black horse, compromise, the devil brings compromise into the church, but still there are some that are faithful. 300 to 500 AD, images come in, church and state unite, Sabbath is changed from Saturday the 7th day to Sunday the 1st. Pale horse, dark ages. What happens after that? The Bible talks about many that are persecuted for their faith in that fifth seal. 
a rope is given to them, they must rest a little longer because Jesus is going to come. The sixth seal is opened and that transitions into the second coming of Christ with a great earthquake and so forth. And the seventh seal, the hailstones come down. In other words, God crushes the wicked and the righteous triumph and Jesus wins and Satan loses. What is the story of Revelation chapter 6? It is this, that no matter what oppression comes against the church, Christ is going to win. He's victorious. Revelation chapter 7, we look at the great story of the 144,000, those that will triumph and stand with Christ in the last days of verse history. We look there at a great multitude that no man could number. Let me read about that. It says, After these things I be looked, and behold, a great multitude that nobody could number. Revelation 7, verse 9. And all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Here, a great multitude that nobody could number. Praise God. Grace is greater than sin, and there will be in heaven this great multitude. What is the purpose of Revelation chapter 7? It's to let you and me know that in spite of the persecution that is coming, in spite of the challenges and the difficulties, Christ is going to triumph. His people are going to triumph. Revelation 8 and verse 9, seven trumpets. What do we know about these seven trumpets? The seven trumpets, you know, trumpets always apply judgment in the Bible. You remember before the Day of Atonement, for 10 days, there were blown trumpets. Trumpets indicate judgment. And so in the seven trumpets, you have starting with the, those that rejected Jesus in the days of the first century, the first trumpet blows, and they, uh, they have the judgments of God come upon them. Then you have the second trumpet with the Roman Empire being judged by God, and then you have apostate Christianity being judged by God, and then you have the um, false religions being judged by God. So the trumpets are God's judgments. But again, in Revelation 8 and Revelation 9, you have that same theme. You have Christ judging and Christ triumphant. So let's get it together. Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is revealed as the dying lamb, as the one that washed us, as the one that is our high priest, as the one that lives for us, as the one that is with us at all times. Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus is the one that enables us to overcome. Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, Jesus is the one who is sitting upon his throne, the one who is ruling for everlasting to everlasting. He is the one who is our dying lamb, our living priest. He is the one that opens the books, Revelation 5, and the one who enables us to pass the judgment. Revelation 6, he is the one that's with his church in every generation and enables it to be victorious. Revelation 7, he is the one that causes the 144,000, the great multitude, to triumph. He is the one that will never lose a battle with Satan. Revelation 8 and 9, he is the one that judges all wickedness and triumphs over all the forces of hell. Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, it begins, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven with a cloud. What's that cloud represent? In the Bible, it's a cloud of angels and a rainbow upon his head. What's the rainbow? After the flood, God's justice mingled with God's mercy. And that he had on his head a face like a sun and pillars of fire. The pillars guided God's people during the days of Israel, and God still guides his church. A little book is opened. There's only one book in the Bible that was ever closed. That's Daniel. Revelation 10, the little book of Daniel, is opened. But as that little book of Daniel is opened, God's people take that book and they eat it. It is sweet in their mouth. They can't believe the prophecies. They believe Jesus is going to come by. They read the prophecies of Daniel. But it's bitter in their belly because Jesus doesn't come. Did that ever happen? It sure did in the Advent movement in the 1840s. You can go back and study about it in history. These early Advent believers studied the book of Daniel. It was sweet in their mouth. They thought Jesus would have come. It was bitter in their belly. And then were they going to give up? What does the angel say? He says, I went to the angel and said, give me the little book. And he said, take it and eat it, that book of Daniel. It'll be in your, make your stomach bitter, but it'll be sweet as honey in your mouth. I took the little book in the angel's hand. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, and I ate it, but it became bitter in my belly. But the angel said, prophesy again. God took a group of people through 
that disappointment in the early 1840s and he said, prophesy again. Just like Jesus' disciples thought he was going to come in 31 AD. They thought he was going to establish his kingdom, didn't they? James and John said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, make me sit on your right hand. Make me sit on your left hand. They wanted to be exalted in the kingdom. Were the prophecies there? They were. But the disciples misunderstood the prophecies of the Old Testament and thought that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. But he did not do that, did he? And were they disappointed when Jesus died on the cross? They were. But did he say prophesy again? He did. And they prophesied on Pentecost and 3,000 were baptized and the New Testament Christian church impacted the world. Look, my friend, what happened in the first century is going to happen at any time. A prophecy misunderstood, bitter in the belly, disappointment, then Christ saying prophesy again. Last days of verse history, they studied the prophecies of Daniel. And as they did, they were bitterly disappointed. Jesus said, prophesy again. They did. And the message would go to the ends of the earth. Christ would be victorious even out of the disappointment that would take place in those early 1840s. What's the theme of chapter 10? It is that Jesus Christ can take every disappointment. He can turn our sorrow into joy. He can take our dark valleys into mountain peaks. Jesus Christ can take our tears and wipe them away. Whatever disappointment you're going through, whatever sorrow you're going through, the Christ of Revelation can enable you to turn your sorrow into joy. What about Revelation chapter 11? In Revelation chapter 11, we have a picture of the French Revolution. In Revelation chapter 11, we have a picture of the time when the word of Christ would be burned in the streets. They did that in the French Revolution. The Bible describes that in Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, it looks like truth is put down. I love that poem by James Russell Lowell. Truth forever on the scaffold, right forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways the future. And beyond the dim unknown stands God keeping watch above his own. Truth will triumph. Revelation chapter 11, what does it say? The seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ and his Christ shall reign forever and ever and ever. Jesus Christ is triumphant. What is the purpose of Revelation 11? It is to show that the kingdom of God will triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. It'll show that Jesus wins and Satan loses. Now, up till Revelation chapter 12, you have three, three, three sequences of seven. You have the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You have the seven seals in Revelation chapter 6, 7, and finishing in 8. You have the seven trumpets in 9, bridge with 10, and finishing in 11. So you have those sequences. In those three, seven sequences, they take you from the first century to the end of time. Seven churches enable you to understand that Christ can enable his people to overcome whatever challenge they face. He's done it in every age and he can do it for you. Seven seals enable us to understand that Jesus' church will face opposition through every generation, but he'll enable it to triumph. Seven trumpets enable us to understand that the wicked will one day face the judgments of God, that righteousness will reign. When we come to Revelation 12, it's the hinge upon which the book turns because from 13 to 22, we have end time messages. Everything up to that time positions us for that time. In Revelation chapter 12, there are four great episodes. First, Satan battles against Christ in heaven. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9. Jesus wins. Satan loses. Satan's cast out of heaven. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 to 6. Satan, centuries pass. Satan tries to destroy Jesus. It's a baby, but he doesn't win. Jesus wins. Satan loses. Satan does not destroy Jesus as a baby. Remember, Herod passed a decree that all male children should be killed under two. That didn't happen. Jesus was protected. The angel came to Joseph and he said, Joseph, take your family to Egypt. He did. Episode number three, Jesus protects his church during the Middle Ages. Revelation chapter 12, And verse 6, and the woman, who's that? The church. What did she do? She flees into the wilderness where she's a place prepared for God that he should feed her 1,260 days. What's that mean? 1,260 days. In Bible prophecy, you're going to get all the references to this. One prophetic day equals a literal year. 
So that's 260 years. When did that take place? Dark ages. Where was the church? In the wilderness. But what happened? God prepared a place for her. When you go into the wilderness of your life, God's going to prepare a place for you. When you go through those dark valleys, God has a place prepared for you. Don't give up, my friend. Hang on. Fourth episode. No, first episode, Satan tries to destroy Jesus in heaven. Tries to take over his throne. Satan's cast out of heaven. Second episode, Satan tries to destroy Jesus as a baby. Satan is cast out. He is, he is demolished uh, in the sense, the, not ultimately destroyed till the end time, but in the sense Satan doesn't win. Jesus does. Satan is defeated is the better word. Satan tries to destroy God's people in the Middle Ages. What happens during that period of time? Christ has a place for them in the wilderness. And the light of truth, although it flickers, still burns. And God still is a people. Satan does not win. Jesus wins. Satan loses. Satan attacks the remnant, the last day people. Revelation 12, verse 17. The dragon Satan is angry with the woman. He goes to make war with the rest of her offspring that keep the commandments of God and of the testimony of Jesus. The devil is angry with God's true people and he's going to go make war. He's going to try to make war. But who's going to win? Who's going to win? Jesus is going to win. Now, who does he make war with? Those that keep the commandments of God. Listen to me, my brother. Listen to me, friend. Listen to me. God will have a group of people in end time that are keeping his commandments, including the Bible Sabbath. And as he does, Satan is going to be furious with them. Revelation chapter 13 describes the fury of Satan. It describes a time that the beast power will arise, that the mark of the beast will be enforced, that no man will be able to buy or sell except he has the mark of the beast, and that ultimately a death decree will be passed. Does the Bible say that? Let me read it to you. And he causes all, Revelation 13, verse 16, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell except he has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then it says he was granted to give power to the image of the beast, verse 15, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So here in Revelation 13, the war that was predicted in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with those who keep the commandments. Here's the war that takes place. Uh, there is a political religious alliance in Revelation 13. Church and state unite. The mark of the beast is enforced. And as it is enforced, nobody could buy or sell, save he that has the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, Look at Christ in Revelation 13. Where is Jesus in Revelation 13? In Revelation 13, the Bible says this. It talks about Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8. The Christ who is slain from the foundation of the world, what does that mean? It means that the plan of salvation was in the heart of God from the very foundation of the world. And that Jesus' plan to be victorious over Satan was put into, into practice once Adam and Eve sinned. So when Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus came to that garden with the Father and he said, remember the promise in Genesis 3 verse 15? And Jesus said that the Messiah would come one would come that would bruise the serpent's head, but he would have a bruise on his heel. So the very plan of salvation was put into action when Adam and Eve sinned, and that was the guarantee of the victory over the beast, his image, and over Satan. So right here in Revelation 13, you have that sense that the devil's not going to win. He may pass a death decree. People may not be able to buy or sell, but he is not the winner. Jesus is. In Revelation chapter 14, you have the opposite of Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, the beast is on center stage. Revelation 14, Christ's people are on center stage. John pictures them in Revelation 14, verse 1 to 5, as redeemed, standing on the sea of glass. John pictures a message in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, that is going to enable them to stand on that sea of glass. 
Look, here's Revelation 14, verse 6. What does it say? I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Here's an angel that flies. It's an urgent message. In the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is that? It's God's truth that's go to the end of the earth, the good news of Jesus to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, that's reverence, respect, obey God, give glory to Him, give Him glory in your lifestyle. The hour of God's judgment has come. What's Revelation 14? It says, look, no more business as usual, no more pleasures as usual. The hour of God's judgment is come. We are living in the judgment hour, so worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. Who's the one that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters? Who is that? He's the Creator. This is a quote from the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And then it goes on to say, worship the one that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of water. Same expression. So we worship the Creator by keeping His Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a sign of legalism. When we keep Sabbath, we remember God created us. In an age of evolution, He made us. We're not accidents. When we keep Sabbath, we rest in His love and care. We are resting from His works, from from our works. We're resting in His grace. We're resting from our goodness and accepting His graciousness. We are resting from anything that we can do, our labors and toils, and we are resting in the one that redeemed us by the grace of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Sabbath is a symbol of rest, not works. It's a symbol of grace, not legalism. Also, Sabbath points us forward to the time that Jesus will make the earth made new. He made it once and he can make it again. So Sabbath is that link in the golden chain that reminds us he created us, that he redeemed us, and that he's coming again for us. So what does it say in Revelation 12, 17? God's going to have a group of people that keep the commandments. Revelation 13, the devil's going to be angry with them and pass a decree that keeps them from buying or selling that is a death decree. Revelation 14, God says in an urgent message to all mankind, God calls us back to the judgment hour and that in the light of the judgment, accept the gospel of Christ and you're going to be saved through the gospel. And he calls us to worship the creator and keep God's commandments. There is an urgent call back to obedience, back to keeping God's commandments because we're saved by grace. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's going to have a group of people that are faithful to him at end time. I want to be part of that group, don't you? I want to be part of God's end time people. Revelation 15 and 16. Revelation 15 pictures the redeemed again on the sea of glass. They sing the song of Moses. What's the song of Moses? Egyptians were were pursuing the Israelites. The Israelites were just about ready to uh, go through the Red Sea, but they were there at the Red Sea. They couldn't proceed and God miraculously opened the sea. The Israelites went through. The Egyptians went to go through. The sea crashed in upon them. Israelites are on the other side. They sing the song of Moses, the song of deliverance, the song of victory. In the last days of earth's history, when the beast power tries to oppress God's people, they will sing the song of glory, the song of victory, because they will be delivered by Jesus Christ. The Bible says, They sing the song of Moses, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall fear you? The nation shall come and worship before you, for our judgments are manifest. So before the seven last plagues, God pictures a group of people standing on the sea of glass redeemed. The Bible often does that. The book of Revelation thinks in Eastern thought, not Western. Eastern thought, you always give the conclusion before you give the events leading up to the conclusion. Then we have the seven last plagues. Now, somebody says, wait a minute. I don't understand those seven last plagues. They're really confusing to me. How could a loving God allow those plagues? The seven last plagues are the natural consequences of rejecting God's love and grace. Let me go through them and show you Christ in the plagues. The first plague is a noisome and grievous sore. It's a terrible sore upon the bodies of men. What did the, those who enforced the mark of the beast say? Those that enforced the mark of the beast said, that unless you take the mark of the beast, where you cannot have any physical security. The first plague, the noisome and grievous sore, shows that all physical security is in Christ. 
What did they say also, those that would try to enforce the mark of the beast? They said, unless you take this, you can't buy or sell. What is the second plague? It is the seas become blood. There's no commerce in the seas. The seas are the basic flow of commerce. So what did they say? You can't buy or sell. What's the second plague say? It says that all economic security is in Christ. What about the third plague? The third plague is, the Bible says this regarding the third plague, it says that the rivers and waters become blood and the angel says that they have blood to drink. What's that all about? Um, it says in the third plague, why do they have blood to drink? The Bible describes it in the third plague. It says because they wanted to take the blood of the, and the life of the saints and prophets, in other words, the believers. So in the third plague, God says all life is in my hands. They have said, we're going to pass a death decree to take your life. You see, the first plague says that physical security is in Christ. The second plague says economic security is in Christ. The third plague says our entire life is in Christ. What about the fourth plague? The fourth plague, sun scorches men. They have substituted the Sabbath for Sunday and that which has been the object of their worship unknowingly, the sun scorches men. What does the fourth plague say? All true worship is in Christ. What about the fifth plague, darkness on the seat of the beast? They've looked to the beast power, Rome, for light, and what have they found? Darkness. So all light is in Jesus. Jesus is the light of this world. What is the light? It's the, his word. Thy word is a lamp, Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So all true light is in Christ, the light of his word. What about the next plague, the battle of Armageddon? All true protection is in Christ. They have said, look to us and we'll protect you by this religious political union. All protection is in Christ. What's the seventh plague? Hailstorms that fall from heaven. All true deliverance is in Christ. They've said, we'll deliver you. So the plagues tell a story. What are they, the story did they tell? They tell the story that physical security is in Christ. Economic security is in Christ. Our life is in Christ. True worship is in Christ. That uh, light is in Christ of his word. The true protection is in Christ. Deliverance is in Christ. That's the story of the plagues. They are literal plagues, but they tell a deeper spiritual story. Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, a woman rides upon a scarlet colored beast. She passes around her wine cup of false doctrine. What is the story of Revelation 17? It is that this woman riding upon the beast, who's the woman? The church. Who's the beast? State. Church and state unite in Revelation chapter 17. And as Revelation chapter 17 says, as church and state unite, people are intoxicated with false doctrine. But what happens? They make war with Christ the Lamb, Revelation 17, 14. These make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. You have been called by God. You've been chosen to share his message of love. Will you be faithful to Jesus and the commandments of God in this last generation? The story of Revelation 17 is that in spite of a woman on the scarlet colored beast, in spite of a movement of union of church and state, that Jesus, in spite of this wine cup of false doctrine, that Jesus will still have a people that are loyal to him. Revelation chapter 18, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Another angel comes down from heaven. He has great authority. The earth is illuminated with his glory. He cries mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, become the habitation of demons. Who's in Babylon? Demons. What is Babylon? Confusion, false religion. What is God? It says it becomes the prison for every foul spirit. And then it says the nations are drunk of her wine, of her fornication. The kings of the earth and the merchants have committed fornication with her. They become rich through her luxuries. What do we see there? Nations of the world, politics, Babylon, religion, merchants, economic. So we see economic, political, religious powers all uniting and they unite. And God says, come out of her, my people. This is God's final appeal. Babylon is going down. Babylon is going to be destroyed. This is God's final appeal to your heart to step out and follow Jesus and keep his commandments and his word. What do we see in Revelation 19? Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. It starts the four hallelujahs. I love that fourth. Alleluia, the Lord God is omnipotent and reigns. Let's be glad and rejoice and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. 
Sin will be no more. Suffering will be no more. Heartache will be no more. The marriage of the Lamb, Christ is going to come. He's going to redeem his people. In Revelation 19, 11 and onward, we see Jesus coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we sing the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. The church-state union has collapsed. The nations of the world that have united with the merchants of the earth have collapsed. Jesus comes. Revelation chapter 20, great thousand-year period. Jesus comes. Every eye sees him. We're caught up to meet him in the sky. Revelation chapter 20, we live with him and sit with him on thrones forever and ever. Satan is bound to this earth, according to Revelation 20. Desolate earth, thousand years, echoing and re-echoing throughout the universe. The wages of sin are death. The wages of sin are death. The wages of sin are death. And then, at the end of that thousand years, the holy city descends. Satan marshals the legions of the lost. Those have been dead or resurrected. They attack that city. They're destroyed. God creates a new heavens and a new earth. Listen, Revelation chapter 21, and I saw new heavens and a new earth, and the holy city, New Jerusalem, came down from God out of heaven. And God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's no more death or sorrow or crying. There's no more pain. Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21, 22, heartache and horror are gone. Disease and disaster and death are gone. Pestilence and poverty are gone. No more pandemics. War and want and worry are gone. There's a new heavens and a new earth. The book of Revelation is the most encouraging book of the Bible because in every chapter, Jesus says that he is victor over the principalities and powers of hell. And Revelation comes to an end. And the spirit, Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears come and let him who with thirst come and whoever desires, let him come and take the word of life freely. The book of Revelation ends with an appeal. Come, come, come. Are there somebody here that you've never accepted Christ? Jesus is saying to you, come. Don't put it off any longer. Come. We are living when the sands and the hourglass of time are running out. And Jesus is saying to you, come. Come and accept his grace. Come and accept his mercy. As you come, he won't cast you out. Jesus will forgive you of your sins. Jesus will change your life. Is there somebody that once knew Christ that drifted away? Jesus is saying, come back. This is the time to come back. Don't drift any further, Jesus says, come back. Is there somebody who's struggling with some sin? And Jesus says, I can give you power to overcome. Come. Is there somebody? that's never been baptized by immersion. You've never gone under the water. And I'm appealing to you to come. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come under that water. I would love to see you come to Christ. I would love to see you walk through the water. If you're living in the Virginia area, come. Look us up at Living Hope Seventh Adventist Church and you come. If you're not in the Virginia area, look up an Adventist pastor. Get him to study with you about baptism. If you want to be baptized, put a comment in the section. If you need to be re-baptized, oh, we'd love to talk to you. If you just come to Jesus, put a comment in. We'll be in touch with you. I appeal to you as I pray to make a decision to follow Jesus. Come to him. Accept his grace. If you've not been baptized, be baptized. If you need to be re-baptized, come to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you that the book of Revelation is a book of victory. Oh, we praise you that in Jesus and by Jesus and through Jesus, we can be victorious. I pray for those that need to make a decision to be baptized. Help them to contact us, Lord. We really want to help them to get ready for that day. Oh, Jesus, move upon their hearts. We pray thee and may each one listening be saved in your kingdom. May we rejoice around your throne in Christ's name. Amen.